is our last Sunday in a series that I've been doing called Once Upon a Land. And the kind of play on words for this is that fairy tales, we've been talking about fairy tales, they usually start with once upon a time. And the, the land part that comes in, and we say, okay, it's not once upon a time, but once upon a land. What that means to, to me, what that means to the series is that location actually is what separates the difference between a fairy tale and like something that you read in the Bible. Because they both have incredible characters. They both have incredible stories. They both have incredible morals and values that you can get out of. But what really is the difference between the two? Well, in the last two weeks, we've been looking at well, the big difference is location. And, and we've been coming, uh, the point that I've been trying to kind of drill home to you is that real things happen in real places. So when we talk about something that, that we've been reading in the Bible, like last week, the week before, those are real things because I could point you to a location and say, this is a real location. And then we could back that up with sources even outside the Bible that can prove and show that, yes, what the Bible is saying here coincides with history, coincides with archaeological digs, coincides with all of that stuff. Real things happen in real places. And today we're talking about a real conversation that happened between real people and it happened in a real place. And this real conversation with real people in a real place is significant because this conversation paved the way for the future of the church. We sit here in this building because of this conversation that happened. We sit here and we have the opportunity to have, I mean, we're in a city where there's tons and tons of churches and that's such a blessing, but that was only made possible because of a conversation that happened that we're gonna look at and talk about today. And then there's a, a really intimate side to this conversation as well. Something really important happens within someone's heart. And I hope that today you guys are gonna get an opportunity towards the end of the service where I'm gonna invite you in to have a conversation with God. And if you've never done that, that's okay. I'm gonna tell you exactly kind of how to do that. It's not weird, it's not wonky. It's just, it's, it's, it's a conversation is a normal thing. It's just normal talking. So I'll show you how to do that. But let's go to the location that we're going to be talking about today. It's a town, it's a city, it's called Caesarea Philippi. Now what's significant about this place is that this is not a Jewish town. See, the majority of what Jesus did, if you read through the New Testament, most of Jesus' His work and his ministry and, and, and the stories that we read about him, they happened around Jerusalem. They happened in Capernaum, which was where Jesus said was his kind of home base, his hometown. And those happened to primarily Jewish people. And they, they primarily happen around Jewish towns. And what's different about Caesarea Philippi as a location is that there's nothing Jewish about this place at all. In fact, we can look at it on a map here. Caesarea Philippi is 25 miles, so almost, you know, it's a marathon, 42 kilometers or so, north of uh, the, the Sea of Galilee. You know, it's, it's a five-day walk. Now, for those of you that have ever run a marathon, hopefully you did it in a shorter time than five days. Um, but this, it took five days to cover this distance because it was so mountainous, so hilly, it wasn't easy terrain to walk. So Jesus takes his disciples. They're going to go five days away. Now, the other significant things about, about Caesarea Philippi here is that because it had no Jewish influence at all, it was extremely, extremely, uh, you know, p paganistic is the word that I was looking for there. It was a very important Roman Greco city. So it was settled, you know, with Greek uh, background with Greek mythology, with, with, uh, with Greek kind of practices to it, but it had nothing to do with Christ. That's the important thing for you guys to take away from this, is that it was not only 25 miles away, it was five days away from anything that had anything to do with Jesus or Jewish people or miracles or anything. It was completely, completely removed. Now, the way that this city, Caesarea Philippi, was even discovered, it was discovered in 330 BC by a man that many of us have read and heard about, a guy named Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great is moving down this map here and he's conquering as he goes and he comes to this place and at the time there was no city, it didn't exist, there was nothing there at all. He's just kind of walking in the wilderness. As he's walking in the wilderness, he sees this big cave 
This cave had this huge, huge opening in it here. This is what it looks like today, modern day. And he sees this big opening in here. And he says, you know, okay, well, takes a look at it. And out of it, so now there's no water coming out of it because they've redirected the water. But out of it was flowing water. Now, as a good uh, Greek person, Alexander the Great would have looked at this and he would have said, wow, a cave with flowing water out of it. That means that this is a location that the gods are happy with. The gods love this location because they're blessing it with water. And so he settled there. When he settled there, he brought with it Greek culture. He brought with it all of the gods that they worshipped. And they worshipped a ton of them. And in fact, at the beginning, at the front of this cave here, inside there's a big pool of water that the water was coming out of. Now today we know it's coming from a spring. But he thought it was coming from, from hell. He thought it was coming from Hades because they couldn't find the bottom to it. And because there was no bottom then that means that no bottom existed. That's kind of the flat earth theory. Because you can't see it curve, it means there's no curve. If, you're, if, if you believe that the earth is flat, you can come down front at the end and receive prayer. You know, I, that'll be the one thing in three years now that gets me in trouble. Okay, so this was bottomless. And because it was bottomless, what they felt like was when the, when the spring was flowing, that the gods were coming out and blessing the land. And then when the spring wasn't flowing, that it was a season where the gods were receding and they were going all the way down to Hades. That's why this is actually referred to as the gates of Hades. You know, a very intimidating name, but really what it was is it was, you know, the Greek people just didn't understand how to go to the bottom of a cave. And so this obviously goes down to hell, the gates of Hades. And then along with just the, the gates of Hades there, they would end up building temples and they would end up worshiping other gods. And in fact, they built an entire city around this place. And the reason that they built this is because Alexander the Great discovered this cave with this enormous kind of supply of water. And with it, as this city was built up, it, it brought with it Greek culture. It brought with it the arts. It brought with it everything that, that was important to, to Greco-Roman society. And you can even see, it, you know, towards the, the back here against the mountain. I think it's called Mount Hermon. And against the back here, you've got the Grotto of Pan. Now, that is the cave. It's called the Gate of Hades, but it was also referred to as the Grotto of Pan because they were worshiping the God of Pan. Pan is the Greek word, and we get the word panic from it. We also get pandemonium from it. And, and this was the God of Chaos, that's what they were worshiping here. I, you know, if I'm going to worship gods, I'm going to like worship the God of money or the God of love or the God of, you know, I, I'm not. I'm, I only worship Jesus. But I don't know why they chose to worship the God of chaos or they called somebody the gates of Hades. But, but that's what they did. And so along with the grotto here, the grotto of Pan, they also built just these all kinds of temples. I've got another picture here for you. So here on, on my left, you've got the, the grotto of Pan. And you've got a temple that's built to Pan. And behind it, you've got the cave with the, the opening. That's where, you know, the, the gods went in and out. And then you've got a temple for Zeus over here on the side. And the, the fact is, is that even in this picture, there's five or six temples or platforms for different gods that they were worshiping. And then not only that wasn't enough, at the back of all of these, inside the rock wall... They carved these, these beautiful, I mean, if you look at them today, they're these beautiful archways. And in each archway, they would put a god. And so not only were these temples built, but the entire back of the city there was just filled with gods. It was filled with, with everything that they worshipped would go back there. Now, that makes me wonder, why would Jesus take his disciples five days away to the most non-Jewish city that they could travel to. See, Jesus takes, he's going to have a conversation with them. But he takes them five days away for a conversation that he could have had anywhere else. He could have had it in Capernaum where they were from. They didn't have to go on a walk. You know, I like to think about the walk or the journey that they went on. Five days of walking to get to a place just for a conversation. I bet there was a lot of, you know, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Mama, iPad that battery is dead. Can I have my phone? No, you can't hit your fellow disciple. You guys are in timeout. If I have to come back there, does anybody say that? Kids in the back of the van. If I have to come back there, you're going to regret it. 
a five day walk, a five day journey. But I, I, I feel like I, I have a, kind of an idea as to why Christ did this. See, Christ wanted to have a conversation with the disciples, but in that he wanted to ask them a question. And he wanted to know what their answer was, what their, their real answer was. And so what he did is he took them away from any of the Jewish influence that was around them. And he put them in a location that was extremely far away from any Jewish influence. So that meant that the disciples' daily routine would have been disrupted. It meant that the influences of going to the temple and aggravating the Pharisees and the Sadducees and trying to get them mad at Jesus, that whole routine was broken. It, it, it meant that they didn't have a show to put on because there were no Jewish people watching them. They, they didn't have an expectation to live up to. They weren't Jesus' disciples in Caesarea Philippi. In Caesarea Philippi, they were just a bunch of new guys that were in town. And so Jesus wants to pull them away from everything that they're comfortable with. He wants to pull them away from their routine. He wants to pull them and separate them away from everything that they know about, especially their, their position, uh, what they do every day, but what they represent. What's, even their, what's their position with Christ? See, in Jerusalem, they had a position with Christ. See, Jesus was somebody that the Pharisees didn't love. He was a Messiah. He was a teacher. And he had his disciples. The disciples were known to be the disciples of Jesus. There was something that came with that. So when they go to Caesarea Philippi, they even lose that identity. So Jesus takes everybody from everything that they're comfortable with, from their, their, their hometown, and he puts them in a completely new and strange place where they have no identity. Everything that made them who they were up to that point is, is muted. It doesn't matter because no one in Caesarea Philippi even cares about it. Now, we, we can talk about this town. You know, I could even relate this to because Jesus takes them to a place that has no Jewish influence. Well, you know, Caesarea Philippi today could, you know, it could be parts of Cape Town. It could be, you know, parts of America. It could be part, it could be anywhere. Think about a place that has no influence from God. It's a place that needs a church. It's a place that's really far away from God. So the disciples go to this place and they honestly don't belong there. In fact, they probably, probably have a little bit of a feeling in them of we probably shouldn't be here. It wasn't like that they could accidentally stumble into the wrong alleyway or into the wrong street and, and get in trouble. You know, it, this was a place that they traveled five days to go to. They should not be there. They would have been uncomfortable. And so in this place, removed from everything that they know, their identity stripped down and taken away. They're just guests. They're just a group of guys that followed Jesus too far away. And they get here. And I like to think that when they walk into town, they walk up here near the grotto of Pan, that they walk up really near to the gates of Hades. Because later we'll see in this conversation that Jesus references the gates of Hades. Now, it doesn't say in the Bible exactly where they were and where they stood, but it does say that they were here. Matthew directly references that they were in Caesarea Philippi, which puts a date to it. It puts evidence to it. And then they've dug this town up and they've been able to confirm everything that Matthew talks about. So Jesus walks in here with the city. And I, for this, I want you guys to participate in this. You've just come on a five-day journey with Jesus. You're probably mad at each other. You've been sleeping on the road. You need a shower. You need a bath. You can't obviously bathe in, you know, the gates of Hades because, you know, that would be, uh, you know, offensive to their gods. And so Jesus pauses you there and he asks you a question. And we'll see here in Matthew. We're going to look at Matthew 16. Now, this is the beginning to the conversation that changes the direction of the church forever. And this is going to be the beginning of the conversation that changes the life of one of the disciples forever. And it's the beginning of a conversation that we're going to have with ourselves here at the end of this message. So it says, Matthew says this, he's recounting this event. And he says, when Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, so we know where he is. Now you guys know a lot about Caesarea Philippi because you've, I've shown you the place, I've told you about it. And he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, th this is an interesting question. It's interesting because I did research on it, and it made it interesting to me. So I hope it, I can convince you to be interested in it. But if he'd asked this question in Jerusalem, he would have gotten a very different answer. But 
he asked this question in Caesarea Philippi, a place that had no Jewish relationship at all. And why would Jesus ask a question about Jewish culture, Jewish religion, about what he was trying to do with undoing the temple, tear the temple down and raise it up in three days? These people had no clue about any of that stuff. Why would he ask that question in a town that had no reference point for any Jewish culture or any Jewish religion? But that, that, that's what he does. I don't exactly know the answer to that. But, but Jesus, he is getting at something here. And he asks them, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? So now the disciples, they, they pause. So it's, if you're there with them, Jesus asks this question. Hey, who do these people say the Son of Man is? And you're, and you're like, I don't know these people. I don't know what they say. You know, there's no temple here. There's no... Nobody's worshiping God. They're all worshiping all these, you know, stone heads and, uh, you, know, the, you know, the cave with the bottomless pit in it. You know, they're kind of worshiping everything and anything, but there's no worship of, you know, God the creator here. And so I, I kind of like to think that maybe they took a, a stab in, at it. They thought, okay, what are the most kind of famous theories that we hear the most around Jerusalem about who Jesus is? So they just throw out these theories to kind of say, all right, maybe... Here's what they say. And we see it in verse 14. And they answered, well, some, maybe, some say that he's John the Baptist because John the Baptist was fairly well known. And he had his head cut off because he told the king that he couldn't marry one of his relatives. And, and she had, you know, the, the king influence and, and his head was cut off. And that probably, that kind of news travels five days worth. You know, that's sensational. So it probably made its way to Caesarea Philippi. So they think, well, maybe it's John the Baptist. Others maybe think it's Elijah because Elijah was magically taken up into heaven. And so that's a story that maybe would have, it wasn't magic, it was God, but these people maybe thought was, it was magic that did it. So that could travel five days. Or they go on to say, or, or Jeremiah, or hey, you know what? Jesus was really maybe just like one of the prophets. And so then Jesus says to them, okay, but now who do, who do you say that I am? So there's an important shift in these two verses here. And, and this is where I don't really want to like overlook this because this is where the conversation really starts to uh, apply to us. So Jesus goes from saying, from saying this. He goes from saying, who, who do people say that the Son of Man is? So if I were to ask you that, hey, who, does, who do the people that you work with say the son of man is you know for a lot of us we'd be like well, I don't understand the son of man part you know what, what is that and I don't know if they quite understood it either but Jesus is referring to himself as being the son of man because he came in bodily form to take on the sins of the world but he, he asked them such a vague almost like really a weird question who do they say the son of man is I would think that Jesus would ask who do people think that I am but see Jesus had no reference in this place. But maybe the rumors of the Son of Man, the Son of God, had made its way to this place. So Jesus is saying, what are the rumors around who the Son of Man is? And then he's saying, but hey, but for you, for you, for you guys, who do you say that I am? Now, when he asks these questions here, it's probably a a real pause amongst the disciples. And here, here's why. See, the disciples, they walked with Jesus. They knew Jesus. They loved him. Jesus loved them. Jesus told them that he was the Savior. Jesus told them he would die and he would raise three days later. But you know what happened? When Jesus died, every single disciple, every single one of them, felt like when Jesus died, that the vision, the mission, everything that Christ had stood for died with him. And that's why they went and they hid. Not a single disciple, not a single disciple actually stood up and said, no, I believe that Jesus will return just as he said that he would. They only believed that Jesus was who he said he was when he showed back up and he showed them the scars in his hands, the scars on his feet, and he spoke to them. That's when they believed. So the disciples, when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? They don't know that Jesus is going to be the Savior. They don't know that Jesus would rise in three days. They, they don't know what we know. They don't have the context. 
And so for them, Jesus says, yeah, he says he's the Messiah. We're trying to believe that he's the Messiah. But, he, you know, he's a rabbi, he's a teacher. But no one says anything but Simon Peter. And Simon Peter, he had a lot of brass, you know, to him. And Simon Peter was bold and he did bold things. He's the one that got out of the boat and walked on water when Jesus said, hey, step out of the boat and walk. And so Simon Peter, with all of his faith, oftentimes, um, you know, he, he, he spoke more than he could actually back up. He said more than he could actually back up and stand for. But in verse 16, Simon Peter replies to Jesus. He says, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed, the son of the living God. Now, this is super significant. It, again, it's a conversation. Jesus is casually asking them, who do all these people think the son of man is? Who do you think that I am? Awkward pause. They're thinking, they're thinking, they're thinking. Simon Peter says, oh, you are the Christ, the Messiah. Messiah means savior, means the one that would forgive them of their sins. The final sacrifice, the sacrificial lamb. You are the Messiah, son of the living God. What's so cool about the fact that it says son of the living God is because they're standing in the middle of a whole bunch of non-living gods, a whole bunch of dead carved rocks and temples. All around them, there's all these gods that are put in the hillside. All around them, there's the, 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 the grotto of Pan, there's the temple to Zeus, all this Greek worship that's happening. And not a single one of those gods can talk, can act, can do anything. They're just rocks and stones that people have made and then assigned their own value to it. And when Peter says, you're the son of the living God, that's in direct contrast to the fact that they're surrounded by dead gods. And Peter says, you are the son of the living God. And this is a big statement in this conversation. And so Jesus, he hears this and he thinks, wow, Peter, I'm so, I'm so proud of you. This is, wow, you know, I'm shocked. I'm, I'm in shock and awe at your answer for me. And, and here's why, because Jesus knows that Peter couldn't have done this on his own. And he says in verse 17, he looks at Peter after he gets this answer from Peter. And he says, Jesus answered him and blessed Peter. He calls Peter blessed. He says, okay, Peter, you're blessed. You're happy. You're, you're spiritually secure because you can say these words because my father God put these words in your heart and your heart was trustworthy for, for God to put those words in your heart and for you to say those words. You're spiritually secure and you're favored by God. So he was favored by God. That's why God gave him the words to say. And you guys, are, we're all now, we're all favored by God. So we can all have this conversation with God. But he says, you're favored by God. And, and Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood, so mortal man did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. So what's so cool about this part of the conversation is that Jesus is saying, okay, Peter, you said the right answer. And I know for a fact that the only reason you said the right answer is because you're favored by God. You're favored by my father. Because he chose to tell you the answer to my question. Because you're favored by him. And what that tells me is that it's comforting to me because now we're all favored by God. And it's that we don't need man. And Jesus at the time, he did not need man to spread the word of who he was. That God did that. God could do that. Jesus doesn't rely on man to tell others about God. He doesn't rely on man. Jesus is not a victim to whether or not we are willing to or not willing to tell other people about Christ. Because see, it's, it's God, his father, that can reveal the heart of Jesus to anybody on earth at any given point of time. And right here in Peter's heart, God just reveals that truth to Peter and Peter speaks it. See, they, they didn't have anyone that was going before them to tell them all this great stuff that we now know about Jesus because of the resurrection. So out of nowhere, God puts this answer in Peter's heart and he says it. Now, when he says this here, when he tells Jesus, you know, who he is, and then when Jesus says, Peter, I'm so proud of you. I'm so happy that you said this. I'm so happy to know that God is speaking to you and that you can hear God. Jesus goes on here in verse 18, and he says, Peter, and I say to you that, that you are Peter, and Peter means rock, 
And so he says, on this rock, I will build my church. And see, see, that's why we sit here today is because on the rock of Peter, God, Christ built his church. In fact, Peter went out after Jesus died and, and he partnered with Paul. Peter took the Jewish side and Paul took the Gentiles, the non-Jews, and they built the church. And we sit here today because of the influence that Peter and Paul had on spreading the church all over the world. See, this is the part in the conversation that we benefit from. Here we are, Peter took a stab of faith heard from God, declared who Jesus was in a simple conversation five days away from anything that they knew or they were comfortable with. And so Jesus says, Peter, on my rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it by preventing the resurrection of the Christ. And that means two things. The first thing that means is that the literal gates of Hades will close down. As they're standing, maybe in front of the gates of Hades, the grotto of Pan, that literal thing is going to close down. The second thing that it means is that hell, that Satan's will, that, that what the devil doesn't want, the, the devil wants to steal from us joy. He wants to steal from us happiness. He wants to steal peace from us. He, he, the devil wants to, wanted to keep Jesus from resurrecting, from going to the cross. You know, we think... Satan put Jesus on the cross. No, 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 no. It was God that led that opportunity. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Satan would have loved to have prevented that from happening. He would have said, Jesus, you don't have to do this. Make everybody responsible for themselves. But Christ, he went to the cross for us instead. Nothing would stop that resurrection from happening. Nothing would prevent it from happening. And so now, after Matthew has said that Jesus would declare this, we can take a look at Caesarea Philippi now. In its current state today, guess what? The gates of Hades are closed. There is no water flowing through. The water has actually been redirected. It will never again flow the way that it flowed in Jesus' time when he was there walking around. And you can see the Grotto of Pan and ancient Benias, the original kind of center of the city, they're nothing but ruins. See, we don't stand and sit in ruins right now. We sit in this incredible building that we're blessed with. But what's here is ruins. Everything that they built has just fallen to ruins. See, what Jesus said was real. And it happened in a real place. And it happened with real people. And we can depend on that. We can count on that. Because of one conversation that Jesus had with his disciples, we can see that the church was set up to win forever. And we can also see that we were set up for a win. So Jesus asked his disciples the question that, that I want to ask you, and it's, who do you say that I am? See, in, in my life, Jesus has asked me this question uh, many times. I, I remember when I was young, before I gave my life to Jesus, I would lay in bed at night. And I don't, know, I don't know if everyone has this experience, but I would lay in bed at night. And I would feel just my heart would race. And I would feel just this intense, almost calling and conviction that all I had to do was pray a prayer, give my life to Jesus. And I was set forever, set in, in salvation and forgiveness forever. And when I would lay there, it was like I was hearing Jesus say to me, Chris, who do you say that I am? And he was hoping that I would say my Savior. It took me a while, but eventually I got there. You know, I remember a conversation that I had with Jesus when I, I quit my job. I remember pulling out of the parking lot from the company that I worked with. And in my hand was the last paycheck I would ever receive because I had quit my job and started fundraising to move to South Africa to be a missionary. And as I walked out, as I, or as I drove through the gate with my very last paycheck in my hand, I thought, what on earth am I doing? This, my dad told me, when I told him I was going to be a missionary, he was not super happy. Not because, he supports me. He, he, he supports the church and all that stuff. But it was all of a sudden his son was declaring that he was going to give up his job and give up everything that he has and go move to some other country somewhere else and just throw everything that he'd worked to build for away. And in that moment, driving out with that paycheck, Christ reminded me, when he asked me, Chris, who do you say that I am? I said, God, you're my savior. You're my provider. 
when uh, we moved to Cape Town, we had a hard, you know, time one year. We, Casey and I, and I say this, it's public news. I know a lot of people have also had this happen. You know, Casey and I, we had a miscarriage. And in that really, really hard time, you know, we didn't have any friends. We didn't know anybody. Quite literally, we were new to the city, had nobody. And all that, that we could do was, all I could do was build a fire and let Casey just mourn and lay on the couch in front of that fire for days and days and days. But in that time, God never stopped saying, hey, Chris, who do you say that I am? Okay, God, you're my savior. You're the healer. You're a loving father. If you're a loving father, then we trust that Annabelle Brave just got a free one-way ticket to be with you. And so we release her to you. You know, when, when Casey and I were given the opportunity to take over this church, I thought, man, this church is full of people and all of you guys are either crazy or you have problems. <laughs> and I thought, do we really want this, you know? Do we, yeah, you know? Some of you almost convinced me to, no, I'm kidding, you didn't. But, but we, we love you guys, but, but we looked at something that we didn't know how to do. And God asked me, he said, Chris, who do you say that I am? And I, I just said, all right, God, you're just the one that called us here. I don't have to know how. I just have to know how to listen to you and then follow. And so the question for you, I know you've had this conversation with God. You just don't know you have. But God has asked you this question. He's asked you, who do you say that I am? And there's a couple different answers that you've probably said, whether you knew it or not. And the, the first one you maybe said, you're a fairy tale. You're not real. You're no different from a story that I read in a book. I don't believe in you. Or you may say that you're an absolute fraud. You know, when, when I was dealing, I was dealing, there was a time I was dealing with a lot of depression and anxiety and I was walking in Rondebosch Common around the, the circle and I remember the tree that I was standing under and I told Casey, it's easier for me to believe there is no God than there is to believe that there is one. Because if I believe that there is one, then I can't help but make him a fraud. But if I believe there isn't a God, then all this goes away. Fairy tales a lot easier than fraud. But even in that moment, God was saying, hey, Chris, who do you think that I am? I am your savior. I do love you. I am your loving father. So is God a fraud to you? Is Jesus just a good teacher for you? Is Jesus a God for you? Just another God. Worship whatever God you want to worship. Jesus is just another one of them. At Caesarea Philippi, when Jesus died, you could have carved his head in stone and just put it up there with all the other gods that were there and he would have blended right in. Or is God, is Jesus to you? And he says, who do you say that I am? Is he, can you say that he's my savior? See, the, the question that I want you to ask is have you had a chance to answer Jesus? See, I, I'm asking you the question on behalf of Jesus today. And the, the service order is a little bit different. We're gonna be doing this for the next few months just to try it out. But I, I believe that as a church, we should be opportunity makers. And I, I believe in, in that, that if, if I give God the opportunity, that he will respond to you. And the reason that I want to do that is because if God responds to you and speaks to you, then it is better for you. And that something great can happen in your life. In fact, I want you to look around and you'll see on every empty chair, there's the word potential. And it's even in your chair. Because see, I believe that those of you sitting in a chair, there's enormous potential for God to change your life more than you could ever imagine. It doesn't mean it'll be easy, but it is guaranteed. And for all the empty chairs, those are just chairs that we need to fill because there's so many people out there that don't know Jesus and how much Jesus loves them. See, right now here in this moment, I'm asking you the question on behalf of God. Hey, church, who do you say that I am? And so what, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do our, our worship set now. So we're gonna have three songs and it's for you to to get into kind of a heart of worship with God. I wanna be an opportunity maker. I wanna look back on what we've built here at South Point and say that we gave God an opportunity to move and to speak and to talk to you. Now, if you're new 
Or if you don't get into worship, that's okay. You can just hang out. You can just sit there and listen to the nice music. But we also have in the back, we've got a communion table on one side. And on the other side, we've got a table full of candles and a lighter. Please don't burn the church down if you go light a candle. But communion, we're still going to do monthly communion as a church. But this back here, it's, it's, I'm not saying everyone take communion, but I'm saying if you feel God speaking to your heart and God's calling you to be in remembrance of him and what Jesus has done for him, if Jesus says, who am I to you? And you say, wow, you are my savior. And I haven't recognized that in a long time. And you want to go take communion. There's a, an info card back there and you can go back there and you can take communion. If you have a prayer, something you're praying for, believing for, sometimes it's so nice to have some kind of physical representation of that prayer. And so we've got candles in the back corner back here and you can go and light a candle. And, and all we're doing is giving you action to take as God moves in your heart. Our prayer partners will be down front here. For you guys, including me, I'll be on this side. You can come down and get prayer for anything that you want and need prayer for. But I ask you the question, who do you say that Jesus is? And I, I just want you to think about that conversation with him. On his behalf, I'm asking you. And so I'd like for you to answer. And answer honestly. Answer as honest as you can. Now, before I pray and I bring the band out, I, I just I want to lead us in one kind of prayer as a church. And I, I felt led. I didn't do this in the first service, but I felt led to do it in this service. Um, but it, if Jesus is asking you, who do you say that I am? And you can't say that Jesus is my Savior. Then this morning, I'm going to give you a chance to say that. So if you're entering into this conversation with Christ and Christ says, hey, who do you say that I am? And you say, I don't really know who you are, but I kind of would like to know who you are. Or I've been afraid to know who you are. Or I've been afraid to, to respond to you. And if Jesus has been knocking on your heart and saying, hey, let me be your savior and make me your savior, then now's your opportunity for that. So let's bow our heads in prayer. And I'm going to lead us in this prayer. And you don't have to say it out loud or anything. Just just listen to it in your heart. And if this is you that's praying this, then pray this in your spirit. So Heavenly Father, I come to you and I thank you for speaking to me, for asking me who you say, who I say that you are. Jesus, I, I don't know exactly who you are, but I know that you want to be my savior. And today is the day that I will no longer run or walk away. I'll no longer turn or I'll no longer push you away. Jesus, I want to be able to say that you're my savior. I want to give you my life. I want to put my trust in you. I want to stop worrying about my salvation. I want to stop worrying about my future. I want to stop worrying about what others think about me. I want to stop worrying about all of it. I just want to buy into this thing that, that is full of grace and mercy. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, I want to answer you and say that you are my savior. Father, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins and I commit my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen.